Let us continue onwards in the Kuzari. Uh, we're in the second essay on page 149. And we were talking about the explicit name of Hashem and how Hashem will only reveal Himself in this way to the world in very, very limited uh, situations and in very limited windows of human history. Hashem revealed Himself with His explicit name. What does that mean? It means, according to Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, that He manifested Himself as the God of miracles that transcends nature. So therefore, when He speaks to Moshe and He says, you know, you're the first generation that I'm really doing these overt miracles to where mankind can actually see that I'm the God that transcends nature. And therefore, you shouldn't be complaining, Moshe. You're, now you're going to see what I'm going to do. You're going to see the, the hand of yud Kei vav Kei. Whereas before, the forefathers of yesteryear had absolute faith and never questioned me, despite the fact that they only saw the God of nature. They only saw Shin Dalid Yud. That's where we left off last time. So um, uh, we're, on the, we're in paragraph 17, therefore. God revealed himself to Moshe and Israel with his explicit name. That is, in such a way that he left no doubt that it was the creator of the universe who was now intentionally creating these phenomena anew, such as the plagues against Egypt, the splitting of the Red Sea, the Mun, the pillar of the cloud pillar, and so forth. He did this to them not because they were greater than Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, but rather because now they were many and doubts about God existed in their hearts. In contrast, the forefathers had absolute faith and were pure in heart. Even if they had confronted calamity their entire lives, their belief in God would not have weakened. They therefore did not require this kind of overt manifestation. It's not because of Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov's lower madrega that they didn't see the God of miracles. It was because of their higher madrega that they didn't see the God of miracles. So, of course, that explains why we don't see miracles today. We're on a, such a high madrega, right? Okay. Is that what Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is implying, that if you're on a high madrega, uh, that's the reason why you don't need miracles? No, of course, it's sort of like a bell curve. Um, there are people on the extremely high level who are deserving of miracles, and God says, you don't need the miracle. And then there are people who are on the lower level who are deserving of miracles because either history demands it, the history of the Jewish people demands it, or because of their intrinsic greatness. And for them, God will perform a miracle. But then you go to the other end of the bell curve, and that's where we are. We're on the lower, lower madrega that we don't merit, we don't rank to have uh, nature transformed for our sake. There's an interesting uh, story in the Gemara. The Gemara tells us a story of a man whose wife passed away after she had given birth to a baby. And the baby had no milk. The man was poor. The baby had no milk. God performed a miracle, and he miraculously, the man grew breasts so that he could nurse the baby. And the Gemara says, while you might think that this is a great miracle, the reality is that this is a sign that this man was on a lower madrega, that he was on a lower level. Because if he had been on a higher level, he could have placed his trust in Hashem without Hashem having to perform a miracle for him. It's the same idea that Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is trying to convey, that um, the, the higher person is the one who sees God every, in everything around him or her without having to see a miracle in order to believe in Hashem. Okay? Bothered by that story, huh? <laughs> Go ahead. Anyone want to? What? I don't know. That's such a good thing. <laughs> what? You would be to a lot of place. Wouldn't the man feel uncomfortable? <laughs> I guess he wore a burqa or something. I'm not sure. I don't know. He must have worn loose clothing or something. Like that. It doesn't mean that his breasts were enlarged. You can still nurse and not have large breasts. You can have milk. I suppose. I suppose. I, I, I think we should go on. Yeah. Um, I think make lactate. Like if you take this kid on Dom Perignon, like my my uh, cousin adopted children, and she took it's it's for projectile vomiting, and it makes you lactate. Okay. 
<laughs> there you go. Okay. I find that it's a constant struggle in life to decide how much you start you have to make and how much you have to rely on Hashem with everything, with Parnasa, with Shaduchim, with everything. It's always a... Uh, it's like a balancing act. It is a balancing act. Exactly right. And the Sfarim tell us that the greater your level of bitachon, the less hishtadlus you have to make. One has to know who they are. That's why, that's why Chazal are critical of Yosef when he tried to ask the, uh, the Sar Hamashkin to intercede, the wine steward to intercede on his behalf. For you or me, that would not have been considered to be something wrong. But for Yosef's madrega, that was... That was inappropriate. And so Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov were on such a high madrega that they were able to see the God of, the, of creation in nature. It's a very difficult thing to do, but what I believe Rabbi Yudha Levi is alluding to is that miracles are not necessary in order for us to find God in the world where we are. We can find God wherever we are. And we shouldn't think that because we don't have miracles, we're on such a low madrega that it's impossible to find Hashem. You can find Hashem wherever you are. Uh, we conclude this section on page 150 by saying that God is also known as wise of heart. He's just really wrapping it up with one last statement because, and this is a pasuk in Eov, because he is the source of all wisdom, not because wisdom is one of his attributes. We had mentioned before that one of the things that God is, one of the ways that God is described in Tanakh is, is through his actions. And what action is, is God when he is called the God of wisdom? He is the giver of wisdom. And, and that, what we mean is, is that the medieval belief is this belief of Chazal that wisdom can sometimes emanate from the Ribbono Shalolam. You ever have a, an inspirational moment, a Eureka moment? You know that story about Eureka? Yeah. Mm-hmm. An, epiphany. Right? an epiphany. That's the right word, right? Um, and many times that you, uh, epiphany comes from an external source. It comes, it comes from a heavenly source. That Hashem is capable of implanting ideas in our minds in order to be able to give us siyata dishmai, in order to give us divine aid to be able to come up with solutions in life. So therefore, that's why he's called wise of heart, because he imbues wisdom, not because God is inherently wise, because God does not possess any attributes, as we've explained all along in this whole section. But the name in the second part of that verse, mighty in strength, is an attribute of action. That, uh, again, we're talking about God who acts upon the world in a specific way. Um, And so that's what we, again, had talked about uh, before as well. Okay. So, really, that last paragraph was really just the sort of provide one more example of where God's attributes are described in Tanakh in such a way which would imply that God possesses actual attributes. And Rabbi Yehuda HaLevi's objective in this whole section is to say that whenever we find Hashem being attributed with human attributes, they're really borrowed terms. They're meant to be taken metaphorically and not literally. Let's go on to the next section. The Kuzari said, how do you explain, we're on page 150, paragraph 3, how do you explain those attributes ascribed to God which are distinguished by their physical nature, such as seeing, hearing, speaking, writing on the tablets of the law, descending upon uh, Harsinai, rejoicing in his works and saddened in his heart. The Kuzari is asking really two questions rolled into one. Do you see how he's asking two questions rolled into one? They're really two questions. It's a two-part question because one part of the question is, how is it that a completely non-physical God can be described as doing physical things? That's question number one. Or that's actually, uh, yeah, question number one. Question number two is, how do you explain God possessing human emotions, which are also attributable to some kind of physical characteristic or emotional characteristic, which, as we've mentioned before, God is devoid of. God does not have any human characteristics, such as being happy or sad. And yet we sometimes find that uh, the, 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 the Tanakh re, re, re talks about Yismach Hashem b'ma'asav, let God rejoice in his handiwork. Ba'it atzeve libo, that God was sad in his heart. What do those words mean? You know, God was sad in his heart when one happened, when he sees that man is self-destructing right before the flood. And he has remorse that he created mankind. What, what kind of emotional 
descriptions are these of the omnipotent, perfect being who is completely above those kinds of attributes. So that's, that, that's why it's a two-part question. Can someone just turn off their phone, please? Thank you. The rabbi said, this is how we explain happiness and sadness. I have already presented the analogy of the righteous judge who is not tainted by any emotional involvement. So we've, we talked about the idea in previous paragraphs about the judge. Hashem is like a judge sitting on the bench in his robe, and sometimes he will render a verdict that is favorable to the defendant, and sometimes he'll render a verdict that is not favorable, that is incriminating. Now, you might look at the judge and say, oh, when he, when he found, when he exonerated the defendant A, he must have been in a good mood. And when he, when he incriminated defendant B, he must have been in a bad mood. Well, that's the truth is, that's not necessarily true. It's upon hearing the evidence and practicing proper jurisprudence and being a good judge, he rendered proper judgment. So the, the onlooker may think that the judge was being more benevolent and kind in one case and more strict and retributive in another case, but the reality is that the judge has not essentially changed in any way. So that's what he's saying is happening over here. Nevertheless, if the judge renders a verdict which results in success and glory for his people, then people will say that he loves them and is happy with them. And if for others he decrees that their houses should be razed and their city should be destroyed, people will say just the opposite that he despises them and he is angry with them. And so realize, therefore, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is neither happy nor sad. The Torah speaks in um, anthropomorphic terms, and it tells us that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is happy, Yismach Hashem B'masav, that God rejoices in his handiwork because humanity is doing what it's supposed to do. So when humanity does what it's supposed to do, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in a metaphorical sense, is happy. But we realize that, ascent, that God cannot be essentially affected by human behavior. And therefore, it's not appropriate to say in a literal sense that God is happy, but that God sees that mankind is fulfilling his requests and doing his will, and therefore he is able to reward man properly. HaKadosh Baruch Hu, therefore, is able to bring um, proper reward to the world. And therefore, we say in a metaphorical sense that Hashem is happy. When do we say metaphorically that Hashem is sad? When he has to destroy the world. It doesn't literally mean that he's sad. It means that just like a judge has to bring punishment to those who are criminals, it means that it's unfortunate because man had the free will to choose properly and man did not, but Hashem does not essentially change. God changes even less than the judge. The judge may go home at the end of a long day of sitting on the bench and after he's condemned a criminal to the death penalty or to a life in prison, the judge may go home a little bit depressed. And will have to have a couple of stiff drinks at the end of the day. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is completely removed from that sensation as well. You know, because Hashem is not affected by the judgment. Hashem is unchanging and does not possess emotion. So that's how we explain emotional responses that are described in Tanakh. How do we explain physical actions that are described in Tanakh, like Hashem splitting the sea, Hashem taking the Jewish people out with a strong arm. The wind and all the elements operate according to Hashem's will. They can therefore be formed into divine speech, just as the heavens and earth were formed. This is how we say that God writes or speaks. This is what happened at the giving of the Torah. When the Torah writes, says that God inscribed the letters onto the tablets, how did Hashem do that? Hashem doesn't have a hand. Hashem doesn't have... Uh, a stylus that he can pick up with his hands and write letters with. But because Hashem can manipulate nature, can manipulate the rules of physics, Hashem created a thun, you know, probably like it was in Cecil B. DeMille's uh, Ten Commandments, you know, when you see when that lightning came down from heaven or whatever, or the fire comes down from heaven and engraves the, the tablets before Moses takes them down the mountain. Okay, and in the same way, Rabbi Yudha Levi actually had touched upon this in, uh, in, uh, in the first essay, paragraph 89. You can refer back to that if you like. He talked about how there was an actual physical sound of God's voice speaking to the Jewish people at the time of the Aseris Hadibros. 
And how did God do it? So Rabbi Yudah Levi says, look, I don't know, I can't tell you that I authoritatively can tell you exactly how it happened, but it seems to me that God must have created some kind of vibrations in the air that could mimic <coughs> human voice. Because after all, what is human voice? It's vibrations that emanate from the vocal cords <coughs> and that are amplified in the, in the voice box and then come out of the mouth. That's how we communicate. We're just actually just vibrating um, strings in our vocal cords, and, that, and we're able to form them into words and into sounds. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu does the same thing with the manipulation of sound waves that he can create in the, in the air and cause them to be manipulated just like a, to mimic the mouthing of a human mouth. But it doesn't mean that Hashem has a voice. It doesn't mean that Hashem is, has any relation to the physical world. Hashem manipulates the physical world to mimic human voice. If the, some of you may have been around when I gave my shir the night of Shavuos, and we pointed out that for Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, it is very important for revelation to be part of the physical human experience. And that's why he emphasizes so often God's interaction with the physical world. God is not the removed metaphysical God of the philosophers. God is the imminent a being who interfaces constantly with the physical world. And that's why Rabbi Yehuda Levi focuses so much and emphasizes so much that God does interact with the physical world, many times manifesting miracles. The Rambam took an almost opposite approach. The Rambam said that at Matan Torah, at Har Sinai, there was no voice. The only thing people saw on the top of the mountain maybe was some fire, they heard a shofar sound, fine. But they didn't actually hear Hashem's voice. Because that kind of divine voice is only something that a prophet hears when he's prepared himself and also hears a sound from within. He hears the voice of Hashem from within. But Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is not happy with that. He feels that the physical experience that people have in the physical real world, the, the physical world, so to speak, is what is the basis of our misoros, or the basis of our, of our faith. And therefore, because physical experiences are not given to hallucination on a mass scale, if everyone heard, if, if a couple of million people heard the voice of Hashem that was objectively real, not just something in their minds, but was objectively real, then that's why it's not plausible that this could have been fabricated. And that's why Rabbi Huda Levi so often emphasizes the physical experience of divine revelation and of miracles. Okay, so keep that in mind because this this is a recurring one of the one of those recurring themes that happens throughout the Kuzari that Rabbi Huda Halevi will constantly come back to, and that is the idea that the physical encounters that we have had with the Ribbono Shalolam or his manifestations in this world are the basis of our belief. They are the basis of why we believe that at one time Hashem gave us the Torah, because we actually all experienced it on a national level. And something that millions of people claim to have experienced in a real physical sense is not something that you could just make up. It's not, it's not plausible that one guy would have come along a couple of hundred years after the event was purported to have, to have taken place and said, you know, 200 years ago, our ancestors all saw and heard God all together, and they heard him say the following words. Someone, if, the, if that never happened, someone would have gotten up and said, what are you talking about? I never heard that story before. And if that story that you're just telling me now is true, some, I, I would have expected to have heard it from my grandparents just like you heard it from your grandparents. But no one ever told me that story, and the story would never have been able to have been perpetuated. The fact that this story, outlandish as it is, has been able to be perpetuated through the generations of Kalal Yisrael from one generation to the next, lends plausibility to its veracity. And the only reason why it's so outlandish, if it wasn't true, is because of the physical experience that every single Jew had at Harsina. Okay, so keep that in mind. That's that's really where he's coming from. That's his area of emphasis. We go on. 
So that's physical actions. And this is how we explain God moving within space, such as descending. It says, Vayered Hashem al Har Sinai, for example, that God descended upon the mountain. And here he gives us a very mystical approach, which I think other Mephorshim would not tell us. But he says, a very subtle physical visage may surround a spiritual entity, and this is known as the Holy Spirit. And he's, he's, um, he's quoting again, quoting from, from Sifrei Kabbalah. Spiritual images called the glory of God, such as that which descended upon Mount Sinai, are really made up of this visage. Sometimes this image will be figuratively referred to as simply God. This is what is meant when scripture states that God descended on Mount Sinai. We will expound upon this later when we discuss metaphysics. So what Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is suggesting is that you can have a spatial localization of divinity. That is possible. And also it's possible even on a physical level that some kind of very ethereal essence that is supposed to represent some kind of concentration of God can descend upon one area. This will also be relevant when we talk about Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's emphasis of Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, which for Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is, is drenched with this kind of concentration of divinity. For Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, again, we have to connect God in some way to the physical world so that mankind can experience Hashem on a very real and experiential level. And that's why he talks about HaKadosh Baruch Hu's manifestations to the world. Now, as you'll note, the Rambam is almost the diametric opposite of Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. The Rambam goes to great lengths to distance Hashem from the physical world as much as possible. Rabbi Yehuda Halevi schleps God into the physical world, and the Rambam kicks God out of the physical world, if I may use those terms. For Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, in order for the, for, for the Jewish people to have that experiential revelation, we need to schlep God in. We need to make Hashem part of our physical world so that we can all say, we have saw God, we heard God, we felt God, we experienced God. The Rambam, however, is has an almost opposite concern. His concern is not the experiential revelation, because he feels that revelation has limited uh, influence on our faith, but rather the idea is, is that we have to, because of God's essential nature and because of the Rambam is so um, committed to his philosophical depiction of Hashem, a God that is far removed and completely elevated above and transcends any kind of physical uh, association, God therefore has to be far removed from any kind of physical um, connection. And therefore, you'll find even in the 13 principles of faith that are authored by the Rambam, you'll see a distancing of any kind of physicality. And lo de musa guf eino guf, that God has no physical image whatsoever and is, cannot be associated with any kind of physical body whatsoever. For the Rambam, that's an impossibility. I don't know whether it's an impossibility for God to occupy physical space for other medievalists. You know, we're used to thinking that dogmatically it's impossible uh, that, uh, well, I don't want anyone to accuse me of being a Christian, right? Um, the question is, is, is it dogmatically antithetical to Judaism to believe that God could occupy himself in human form? In a sense, it is, but is, is that the reason why we reject Christianity? That's not the reason why we reject Christianity not because of the profession that God uh, uh, assumed human form. That in, itself, in and of itself would not be enough of a reason to say that Christianity is wrong. Christianity is wrong because historically we know that uh, God never became this, the, son, the son of himself, right? And the rabbis of the time knew Yashka, and they saw that you're, you know, you're not who you say you are, or you're not who the people, your disciples say who you are. You are not a deity. You're just a yeshiva bachar, you know, so yeah, and you're, you're a yeshiva bachar who's not doing very well in yeshiva, so we're, we're going to have to expel you from the academy. That's essentially what happened, and then that's, he spun off and went off the derech, I suppose is what we would say today, and started his own sect of Judaism. But the reason why we reject Christianity is more based upon the historical uh, falsehood of it, uh, and the impossibility of the Torah being altered in any way, 
more than just the specific issue of the impossibility of God occupying physical form. For the Rambam, that's absolutely a, a, anathema to Judaism, but I'm not so sure if it's absolutely anathema for Rebbe Yehuda Halevi. Okay? I don't want to be misquoted here. I hope I've been very clear. I am not a Christian. <laughs> I'm clear on that. I do not subscribe at all to Christianity. I have no faith in it. I think it is utter falsehood. Everyone clear on that? Okay, good. Okay. <clears throat> Let's just go a little bit further because I wanted us to start the more Nevuchim today. <clears throat> the Kuzari said, granted you've successfully explained all of God's attributes so that they do not indicate multiplicity. And that was really the objective because God is absolute unity, so he, therefore he can't have any attributes. But the question is, how do you defend the attribute of desire which you ascribe to the creator whereas the philosopher distances it from him? Okay. So we're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about divine will or divine desire. And you, the truth is, you can close your Kuzari for now, but I want to, this is really where we're going to focus our discussion on the Mor Nebuchim. This was one of the great areas of, of distinction that the Rambam himself draws between the philosophers of his time and himself. You know, as I started uh, mentioning before when we talked about uh, the differences between Rabbi Yehuda Halevi and the Rambam, Maimonides is very committed to the beliefs of the philosophy of, the philosophy of his time, um, what we would call Aristotelian philosophy, some Neoplatonic philosophy mixed in as well. And uh, it was very, very, very popular in the Arabic world at that time, the, uh, the um, uh, of which Rambam was very much a part. And part of the entire um, worldview of that Arabic philosophy system that the Rambam was a part of was that God is completely transcendent and has no association with human attributes whatsoever, which Rabbi Huda Levi, as you've seen, completely agrees with. But... The Rambam was even more committed than Rabbi Yehuda Halevi was to this kind of worldview, and therefore, for the Rambam, it's a serious problem. There are serious problems in the suggestion that God, at one time in human history, in world history, created a universe. Because if God decided to create a universe, it means that at one point, God had will, God had desire. At one point, God didn't need a world, or didn't want a world, and then boom, Hashem wanted a world and then created it. This, for philosophers, is very problematic because if God is completely perfect, therefore he is immutable, unchanging, how then, is it, can it, how then can it be that Hashem at one point can change his mind? Like if Hashem thought that the world was, right, was a necessary and proper thing to have, then why hasn't the world always existed? And if Hashem is unchanging and there was a point in history where the world didn't exist, then how could Hashem change and all of a sudden bring something into existence that previously didn't exist? Does that not suggest that God is subject to change? And that's a problem for philosophy, for this kind of medieval philosophy that we're, that in, the wor we're in that world. This is one of the reasons why Aristotle professed that the universe was never created. He professes that the universe has eternally existed. For the very reason why, why, because philosophically it's impossible to suggest that God could have one point changed his mind and transitioned from a God of no reality to a God of physical reality. But the Rambam, of course, cannot subscribe to that because the Rambam believes in the Torah. And the Torah says, Bereshis Boroi Eloki Mesa Shemaim Be'esar. It's that God, at one point in, in history, created a universe. So before God created the universe, he was God without a universe. So he was perfect then, and he lacked nothing then. What changed? Something had to change about Hashem's will to bring about a desire to create a universe where previously there was none. And that's the challenge. The Rambam doesn't fully answer that challenge. He just says, God does have will. And this is where we differ from the philosophers of our time. And as you'll note, at the beginning, we've, met, we've actually cited from this chapter before, but it's worth always coming back to, 
This is from Mora Nevuchim, section two, chapter 32. If, uh, if you ever want to have an English text of the Mora Nevuchim for free, it's on Wikisource. Uh, this is where I copied it from. Um, and the previous chapter, previous couple of chapters, discusses the God of creation. And the introduction to this section is where the Rambam writes, there are as many different opinions concerning prophecy as concerning the eternity or non-eternity of the universe. For we have shown that those who assume the existence of God as proved may be divided into three classes, according to the view they take of the question whether the universe is eternal or not. Similarly, there are three different opinions on prophecy. Now, the question is, what is the Rambam doing comparing the three views of creation to the three views of prophecy? If you remember, several months ago, we actually did that chapter where the Rambam talks about the three opinions of creation. There's the opinion of Aristotle that the universe has eternally existed. There's the opinion of the Torah that the universe was created ex nihilo, from complete nothingness, yesh me'ayin. And there's the middle opinion of Plato, which the Rambam also acknowledges, and that is that the universe um, was at one time created, but not from nothing, but from some primordial matter that, has, that had previously existed, and God formed it and shaped it like a molder shapes clay. And the Rambam said that while Plato was not heretical, but we believe the Torah's account, which is that the world was created yesh and that was created from nothing. So what is the connection to the three opinions about prophecy? What does prophecy have to do with God of creation? So it's exactly what I'm going to point out to you now, and that is that just like the Rambam has the dilemma of explaining a perfect, immutable, transcendent God coming into the world at one point and deciding to create it, that presents the same challenge of God presenting prophecy to humanity. How is it that the God who is unchanging and perfect decides for certain people they should be Nevi'im and other people that they should not be Nevi'im? So because we're a little bit short on time, what I'm going to ask you to do is hold on to this sheet. Next time, Emir Tzashem will, next week, next, next Tuesday, we'll still have in class. So let's focus on this topic of nevuah, of prophecy, and how it presents a problem to the idea of the immutable, immutable, perfect, and unchanging God, and why that is. And we'll take a look at the three different opinions that the Rambam has about how people achieve prophecy. Okay, we'll hold it here for today.